All right, welcome everybody. This is the Pathways to Adult Success COVID-19 Social Justice Solutions Forum. Today, our topic is enhancing students' career development experiences during COVID-19 and beyond. I'm Bob Balfance from the Everyone Graduate Center and I'll be serving as the moderator. Amanda, if we can have the next slide. Um, today, we have two great presentations. Um, we have Doug Elmer, uh, the Vice President of Prep KC, and we have Austin Estes, um, the Data and Research Manager from Advanced CTE, um, both sharing uh, some uh, informative and uh, hopefully stimulating uh, thoughts and solutions on how we can uh, enhance students' career development um, through their schooling uh, through COVID and beyond. We will then also have dialogue amongst ourselves and we'll be sharing some other resources on this topic as we, as we want to, do, to normally do. Uh, we're a diverse group of folks from K-12, higher ed, nonprofits, state departments of education. Um, we use the chat function so we can all participate. Please uh, ask your questions and share your ideas and resources as the conversation goes on. Um, and we'll, we have people monitoring the chat to pull those ideas in and make sure your questions get answered. There will be a brief Q&A time after each presentation and then a longer time for group discussion um, at the end. We will be sharing uh, the presentation and all the uh, materials referred to and the various resources discussed um, after the presentation. So what we're really uh, trying to put our heads together today on is how do we put all our students on the path to career success, right? We know our goal is to educate our kids in K-12 and have them ready for both college um, and, and or workplace training, but really a good piece of that is really trying to get them all the way to career success, as well as civic participation, as well as well-being. But a good piece of this is we really want to create a pathway for all our kids through public education, through higher ed and advanced training to a successful career, really, and our idea of adult success. So we're really thinking about how during COVID and beyond, do we, do we enhance that, that career side of the equation? Um, and you know, as, if we look at our, our Pathways to Adult Success framework that we've co-created, right? each of those elements play a role in this. This idea of using early warning systems for more than just high school graduation really fits into, we can also use them to progress monitor, are all kids getting career development experiences and applications and exposures, uh, not just some. You know, and we can then use advanced uh, sort of navigation and guidance supports to make sure that the experiences they're getting are tailored to their emerging interests, right? We're not just giving them, take this because of what's, what's available, right? We're really working to, to really match interests with opportunity. And then we know to really get to all and to really have this be a, a common experience and not just for some, it's going to really take extended partnerships between K-12 and higher ed and nonprofits and business to be able to create all those opportunities for our kids, right? Because it's easy enough to create job shadowing for five or 10 kids, but much harder to do it for 50 or 100, right? So we have to build the partnerships to help with that. And then finally, we're gonna have to have good data, right? Not just on outcomes, but also on participation. So we can actually track, have all our kids gotten career experience, career exposures, career applications along the way to help them make informed post-secondary choices have they gotten good guidance along the way? Have they, do, they have, do they have pathways post-secondary that are attuned to their wide range of career interests? For all that, we're gonna need a common set of metrics. Next slide. Uh, one sort of coming attraction I wanted to highlight is that we're, Everyone Graduate Center is, is doing some pilot work in this area as well. Um, we're starting to work with a couple schools in New Mexico and Louisiana to really co-create with them um, with the staffs, how to have sort of ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade milestones for academic, social, emotional, college, but also career to really say, what are your ninth grade career exposures and applications? What, what happens in 10th, 11th, 12th? Um, so uh, coming attraction, but um, as we learn that, we will, we will obviously, as we do, share our learnings with you. Next slide. And then I just wanted to give one piece of uh, data that we've been, one of the things we've been doing in these forums is tracking the most current data on what's happening to our students during COVID. And as those of you that have been, were, many of you have been with us since last spring, you know, the very first question we asked about how can we support our seniors during COVID? 
right? Because in April, we were very concerned as schools were closing that it was those kids, 12th graders, that, that depended on supports in schools to help them get to a post-secondary destination. And we were particularly concerned um, with really the kids that were on the community college um, track, right? Because many times the supports for that happened in schools from April forward when they were disruptive. And we were able to highlight in our solution forums a number of our uh, learning community partners from the Tacoma Group to Philadelphia Education Fund uh, to some of our, our university partners in Florida and uh, National University. We've highlighted some of the things they did uh, Chattanooga to, to help build bridges in this critical time and help keep kids on that pathway to post-secondary through COVID. Uh, the most recent data from the National Clearinghouse, Student Clearinghouse, um, who's also a, a past partner, um, is, you know, next slide, if you look at it, is in fact uh, a little depressing, right? That sort of our fears in some ways were realized. Um, if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, um, it is for um, low-income school, it is for, <laughs> it is for um, low-income or sort of high-poverty schools, um, and at the right hand of the slide is for higher-income schools. Um, this is not a representative sample, so it is, it is among the schools that participate with the National Clearinghouse, but they still have a pretty diverse sample of uh, higher-poverty schools and lower-poverty schools. And we can see across all schools, there were declines in the percent of students going directly from high school into post-secondary uh, college in the spring, um, last spring, um, we can see particularly if you look at the left hand side that the biggest drop was the community college goers from high poverty schools. Sort of that very group we were most worried about in fact shows that that was a true concern. Um, still pretty big drops uh, for private universities as some kids shifted from private to public schools. Um, and we can see that even in higher income schools, there was still a considerable drop off. Um, this tells us we're going to have a lot of kids that were seniors last year. They're gonna still in need of supports um, to find a pathway to adult success um, through COVID and beyond. And that's, that's gonna be a challenge for us, right? Because all of our institutions, K-12 institutions are set up to take care of kids in kindergarten through 12th grade and higher ed institutions are set up to take care of kids from freshman year on. And there isn't many institutions set up to help kids that are got stuck in the middle, right? So it's really gonna be our nonprofit and community partners but really in collaboration with those institutions. Um, K-12 schools following ways to still give resources and reach out to their seniors from last year that still need guidance. Uh, universities figuring out ways to reach out to kids that are sort of one year off cycle <laughs> in the application process and don't have an institutional home. Um, because despite you know, the, the, the efforts that many folks made and were highlighted here, and those likely made it for being even much worse, uh, the, the emerging data shows it is a true and significant problem. All right, let's get to some solutions. So our first presenter is Doug Elmer, uh, Vice President of Prep KC, and he's here to sh share with us uh, some exciting work and learnings uh, that are happening in his part of the world. Doug, I hand it over to you. Right. Thanks, Bob. Uh, happy to be here. I'll uh, start off with just maybe 30 seconds on Prep KC. We are a uh, intermediate organization that started work in 2006, initially focused probably like many on you, of you on increasing high school graduation rates, but that work pretty quickly evolved to looking at making sure that every student from one of our partner districts has uh, a successful transition into college and ultimately the workplace. Um, we currently work with six school districts on both sides of the state line. For those of you that know the Kansas City region, we've got the Kansas-Missouri state line running right down the middle of the city. Um, we also work with four charter schools here in the city. Um, altogether, we serve about 70,000 students. Uh, three out of four of our students identify as students of color and four out of five of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch. So it's just a little bit about our footprint and uh, the work I want to talk about today really started with some cohort-based career academy work we were doing from 2011 to 2016. Um, not wall-to-wall, -wall, uh, interest-based non-selective career academies across our network of schools. And in uh, 2016, we decided to work with education pioneers to take a look at how our graduates from the class of 2014 fared. 
And what we found is out of the 450 students who participated in those career academies, um, everyone graduated from high school, 74% enrolled in post-secondary, and 80% of those students persisted to their second year. So all really favorable outcomes, particularly from uh, compared to demographically matched schools. And so the Prep KC team really started to ask ourselves uh, two questions. What, what, what were the features of the career academies that made the biggest difference in those outcomes? And how could we make that boutique experience the normed high school experience here across Kansas City? Um, and so what the next slide will show you is kind of the answer to that first question. What were the big differentiators for students in the career academies? And our work with Ed Pioneers and our school district partners and our higher ed and industry partners really pointed to this idea of every career academy student was graduating with something beyond just their high school degree. And uh, as we looked at these, we really coined this term back in 2016, uh, market value assets. Uh, these are tangible accomplishments or a tangible um, credentials that you can put on a resume, you can put in a college application or a scholarship application that really shows how you have a competitive advantage over the typical high school graduate. Um, over the past couple of years, we were really excited that these were adopted regionally across Kansas City. So uh, first, the Kauffman Foundation's Real World Learning Initiative uh, put out a challenge for all of the school districts across a uh, nine count, uh, six county region here in Kansas City to uh, adopt real world learning with a focus on every student earning a market value asset. Um, and these were also embedded in our regional economic competitiveness plan, Casey Rising. Um, so we were really excited to see this picked up regionally. Um, and as you'll see, um, uh, the market value assets, industry recognized credentials, which you know many of you, you have work that focuses on those, students earning nine or more college credits while they're still in high school, uh, students who complete an internship or a client project while they're uh, prior to graduation. And then um, PrepKC has one that we focus on that, that uh, is unique to our network, which is students who are earning high value local scholarships. Um, KC Scholars is a, a scholarship for four-year institutions and the Honeywell Hope Scholarship supports students who wanna earn a two-year degree. The reason we single out these scholarships is in addition to the terrific financial support they provide students, um, they really provide a lot of students wraparound supports during their senior year. So these are both awarded during their junior year. And then you're paired with either a mentor or additional application and transition support throughout your senior year of high school. So um, we think these are real game changers for our students. So we took on this challenge of how do we help every student across our 16 partner high schools have uh, an opportunity to earn a market value asset baked into their high school course of study. And what the next slide shows is a mental model of how Prep KC started to think about this. And kind of the big asterisk on this is this is still early days of this work. Um, we're in uh, the third year of a strategic plan to get to 85% of our graduates earning a market value asset by 2025. Um, and in terms of raw numbers, we should be able to help over 10,000 students earn a market value asset uh, by 2025. So when we think about doing the work on that scale, we really came up with um, this idea of supply and demand. Um, supply is where a lot of our brains go when we start to think about the market value asset opportunities. So these are the literal seats in college courses, um, seats in programs that award IRCs, internships in our regional businesses. Um, and uh, uh, not surprisingly, we do not currently have enough supply for every one of our students to have an MVA. So we certainly are thinking about work on the supply side. And um, I know there's a couple of folks from the Kansas City region on, on the call. A lot of really exciting things are going on in terms of regional coalitions and alliances to expand the supply of these opportunities to all high school students. The place where we've been digging in a lot um, before COVID, but COVID has also kind of pushed us to think about this in new ways, is this idea of market value asset demand. Um, and so what we're thinking about is how do you make sure that every kid understands the value of earning something beyond their college, uh, high school diploma? How do they get all of the um, preparatory experiences and opportunities so that when they, their junior or senior year, when they apply for an internship or they enroll in college coursework, they're ready to go? And then ultimately, how do they successfully obtain one of those? So 
that's where we've been thinking a lot. And uh, what the next slide shows is really how we think about this on a K-12 continuum. Um, so the market value assets, the college coursework, the sitting for your certification exam, those are things we typically assign to the, the junior and senior year. But uh, we really worked with our school district partners to think about how does that journey start in kindergarten? And so what you'll see is we've kind of blocked this out in broad phases. Um, we really begin with third graders um, through elementary school and into the early years of the middle grades, just with career and college exposure. So for us, this is giving kids lots of opportunities just to see the breadth of occupations and particularly occupations that are high demand, high growth in the Kansas City economy. We give them lots of opportunities to just interact with professionals who love their jobs. So we wanna just cement that schema in kids' heads of the connection between your interests, your unique strengths, and then careers that will really kind of inspire you because of who you are. Um, and then this idea of a pro-career mindset. So understanding the connection between those interests, your education, your job, and ultimately, you know, your quality of life as an adult. Um, in some cases, I think we take it for granted that, uh, that young people have someone in their lives who are asking them those sort of questions and providing those sort of opportunities. So we really build that into the school experience. Middle school, we really shift towards um, thinking about who am I and where do I wanna go? Um, so this is where we do a lot of speed networking that we call career jumping with professionals. Lots of opportunities for students to visit work sites. More and more, we're building project-based learning in the middle grades to really give kids roll your sleeves up, hands-on exposure. And this is all leading to kind of the first big milestone um, for our partner districts. Most of our districts at this point are wall-to-wall -wall career academies or career pathways. And so that spring of eighth grade, when you're choosing your pathway and you're really thinking about your high school course of study, that's a big milestone for our kids. And we wanna make sure they go into that pathway selection or that academy selection with tons of information and actually tons of like social capital and social interaction with professionals. So they can really get an authentic sense of, of what it would mean to work in healthcare or work in finance. Um, more and more, we're spending the early years of high school making sure that kids earn the prerequisites they need to open those doors to market value assets their junior and senior year. Um, so this is uh, thematic electives that really just give them the technical skills and the, the knowledge of the discipline to be able to pursue advanced um, internships. It's developing a portfolio that they can show and interviews and show to um, higher ed folks. And then it's just giving them lots of practice with what we call here regionally the essential skills. So these are things like critical thinking, project management skills, working on a team, um, professional communication, all of those things that don't fall neatly into an academic discipline, but that are really critical to be a successful young adult and thrive in the workplace. Um, we layer all this on top of an ac a strong academic foundation, so there's no shortage of things to like work on across this continuum. Um, and we're really working on doing this in a systemic fashion. So we have superintendents and principals that have really risen to the challenge to think about how do we bake this into our course of study, our school culture, and our curriculum and instruction so that it's not, uh, the way we put it is we're trying to get away from retail recruitment of like, let's find 10 kids to do this program and 12 kids who want to do this program, and really thinking about how do we systemically build it into our advisement, our enrollment, our scheduling processes so that kids don't have to, to opt into earning a market value asset. Um, the last couple of slides we can move through pretty quickly and we'll share the deck, but just wanted to give some more examples of what some of those early leading indicators are. So we are in the early stages of trying to develop um, what I would call the bones of an early warning indicator system for market value assets. Um, and so we're working with our districts and we actually have a data summit with our partner districts in January to talk about some common definitions about what do we want every student to have experienced by the time they have to design their high school course of study? What do we want every student to have an opportunity to engage with an experience by the time they start pursuing their market value asset? And then ultimately, how are we doing providing kids with market value assets that align with their interest? So these early indicators are really about that career exposure and career exploration. Um, on the next slide, you'll see some of those early high school indicators 
this is where we're thinking about how do we make sure we're giving you opportunities to practice essentially so that you can feel really confident when you go into college coursework or when you go into a local business to intern. Um, and then this is also where we're trying to get better at collecting data to anticipate what market value asset kids are going to want to pursue because I don't know if any of you feel the pressure that many of us feel at Prep KC and in other places around Kansas City, but you can't go into the summer before a senior year and try to source 300 internships for a senior class in three months. Like we have to ha start having some predictive analytics so we can get a couple years upstream with our industry partners and our higher ed partners to build the capacity. Um, right now we're excited to see waiting lists because that means that student demand is really picking up and districts are getting kids into the market value as asset pipeline. We ultimately want to get rid of waiting lists because we're doing a better job of sourcing opportunities for students. So that's the other key piece around these leading indicators that we're really building. Um, and then finally, the last couple of years, kind of the last mile work in high school. Um, this is work that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and we're actually learning from other organizations in terms of what needs to be in that portfolio as students are completing their market value asset and really planning on a successful transition into whatever comes next, whatever blend of education and starting their career. Um, so these are really what we're trying to make sure that every student graduates with beyond just their basic requirements. Um, I'm happy to talk more about this if you have questions. We have pushed all this into the virtual space over the past nine months. Like many of you, we've probably crammed about five years of adaptation into you know March 13th until now. Um, much of this has been with a lot of hard work on the part of our team and our districts, it, it actually has translated relatively well to the virtual space. Um, there are obviously a few things that suffer. So virtual workplace visits don't work when everybody's working from home. It's just not that interesting to see everybody's like office space or, or living room. Um, we also have some IRCs and I'm sure you're, you're experiencing the same thing in, in your regions particularly some healthcare related IRCs and other IRCs that require clinical hours. We have had to get creative and in some cases offer students alternate opportunities. Um, but a lot of the career exploration and a lot of the career preparation and college preparation um, has been able to translate well into a virtual space. Um, and I think we are starting to ask the interesting question of what goes back and reverts to face-to-face -to -face because that adds value for students. And what do we actually keep in the virtual setting? Because um, once you get it right, there actually are some economies of scale and opportunities to reach more students without putting as much of a burden on our industry volunteers in particular that we have found valuable to be able to get to example, um, talking with a school right before this, where we're gonna be able to have 900 students interact with industry professionals in the course of a school day, all through Microsoft Teams. So. I think that's places where we're learning a lot of lessons about things we may keep doing virtually once we're able to go back to face to face. And then other things, obviously, we cannot wait to get back to safely connecting kids with industry professionals across Kansas City. Thank you, Doug. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, please use the chat to ask Doug questions or to share comments or insights or resources of your own that, that speak to what he's been talking us with us. While you're doing that, I'm going to start off, Doug, with um, what is your, what is your, I guess, either best guess or, or uh, biggest stress about getting to all? Do you think it'll be more of a problem with supply or demand? Uh, first demand, then supply. Um, if we're doing it right, what, like I said, we're aiming, we want to see waiting lists for all these programs right now, because that means all of our districts and all of our kids and families are aware of this and they're, they're pursuing them. So right now we want that pressure because it also helps us make a case to the business community and the higher education community that the demand is there, these programs are going to be sustainable, these opportunities are worthwhile. Um, so right now demand is, is first and foremost. Um, that being said, we're kind of learning that some MVAs are more scale or more easily scaled than others. So for example, um, client projects are tremendous for scaling because kind of by the nature of their authenticity, kids work in teams on them. They're often kind of relatively light on resources. So we're not paying tuition. They can be um, managed by um, an industry volunteer and a classroom teacher. 
So those have been terrific to scale. As you might imagine, internships are much harder to scale, particularly during the pandemic. Um, I think we have a couple of folks from the DeBruce Foundation on the call, and they've done some awesome work with V-ships, virtual internships. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we do kind of, there's always going to be a, a limit to how many internships we can source. So I think we're trying to figure that out. Um, and then one other bonus that I'd throw in is, um, and this is where I'm, I'm fascinated to hear the work Austin's doing is, it's also just the pressure of trying to meet traditional accountability metrics and also now build in this whole other set of aspirations. And if you're gonna do it across the system, there is accountability to that. So we're also trying to help strike the, the balance and find the kind of two for ones where we can be working on prepping for academic testing, prepping for graduation requirements, but also kind of building up kids' capacity to succeed in these real world learning environments and, and attain market value assets. Great. Thank you, Doug. Um, last call. Um, can for, I yes. bring in a yep. few things from the chat? Sure. Quite a yes. few folks have um, just said, this is great. This is fabulous. The continuum had a lot of appreciation. Um, and I think in response to uh, what Doug said early on about the data collection of, of what really was helping these kids move forward and stay focused, uh, Sarah shares, in Washington, we're having these initial conversations with the state, trying to plan out a qualitative data collection that reaches out to those most affected and planning for enough time to really be meaningful in who we talk to and how we weave this information into our plans for the next year in the secondary world. Uh, and there is one more message. It's uh, another appreciation. Thank you, nice work, nicely done and so on. Oh wait, here's more, more from Sarah. I know in my area there's been feedback from our black and brown communities and low social economic status families that transportation has historically been a serious barrier for our students, along with a sense of not feeling like they belong. How have you bridged that gap for these students? Sounds like you've been doing a great job. So that's a question. Yeah, Sarah, that's a great question, and it's not something we have entirely problem solved. Um, in some ways, the pandemic has, has provided new opportunities to connect every student and kind of remove the transportation barrier, and obviously has created digital divide barriers for other students. Um, a few things we are working with, three of our districts are working together in what they call a shared pathway model. So these are contigu contiguous, urban, single high school districts kind of on the uh, southern can edge of Kansas City. They're actually doing circulator transportation where the three districts are sharing a single bus to share costs. And this, like, it doesn't sound that innovative, but I see heads nodding just because districts don't think that way traditionally. Um, we have had some employers who have done a fantastic job of bringing a, as much of the work work-based learning to the school as possible, at least until we get to like that culminating internship. Um, and then there really are some fascinating things across Kansas City with these virtual internships and just other ways of using the virtual space to kind of break down barriers even across school districts. So um, Community America Credit Union here in Kansas City did some really awesome internships that were cross district. And uh, that was right after the pandemic started. So I think there's lots of small experiments. We haven't had a breakthrough yet. Um, as somebody has to do the fundraising for this, I can also tell you way too much fundraising goes to paying transportation cost, but it is a very real barrier for equity. And so when people push back on us about it, we really do make the case that um, even if something seems equitable on its surface, if it's relying on a student to have their own transportation to leave their home high school and get to the business or get to the tech campus, that effectively eliminates opportunities for, I would say, a if not a majority of our students, a significant number of our students just won't pursue those opportunities. Thank you, Doug. I'm gonna now um, pivot and we'll have time for more discussion at the, at the end, but now let's pivot and bring Austin in um, and have him share uh, what he's been hearing and learning about uh, CTE uh, during COVID and thinking about beyond COVID. Austin, over to you. I think, thanks so much, Bob, and, and thanks, Doug, for that presentation. Um, I almost feel like I want to cede the rest of my time and just continue uh, learning more about what you're doing uh, in Kansas City. Um, 
but uh, just for by way of introduction, my name is Austin Estes. I'm the manager of data and research with Advanced CTE. The organization that I work with uh, was founded by the state directors of vocational education 100 years ago. Um, now, state directors of career technical education. So we do a lot of work at the state level, providing um, policy support, thought leadership, uh, and partnership to help support uh, and advance high quality and equitable CTE uh, from the state level. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been hearing from the state level and some of the challenges and uh, strategies that states are, are using to help uh, ensure access to high quality CTE programs and career development opportunities through COVID. Um, so one thing that we've been doing a lot through, um, through the pandemic and through the recession is looking back uh, at the Great Recession and how uh, that uh, economic downturn affected career uh, opportunities for, for recent graduates and you know what what worked from uh, from that period of time and we see that um, in, in the years after uh, the recovery began a lot of the jobs that were recovered during that period went to workers who had more than a high school education who had some kind of uh, post-secondary credential whether that's uh, a two-year or four-year degree, or even an industry certification. Um, and very few of those jobs that were covered went to workers who, who had a high school education or less. Uh, so we're already seeing um, right now during the COVID-19 crisis that the economic uh, recession has been affecting young people, um, people with a high school education or less, and people of color disproportionately compared to others um, uh, other workers. So there's an urgency right now to ensure that there are pathways for, um, for high school students, as well as those who are already, you know, post-secondary students and those in the workforce to get those post-secondary credentialing opportunities so that they can uh, return back to work or they can start their careers um, without uh, kind of getting behind. Uh, so, Career technical education um, is a strategy to, to help with that. Um, and I'm actually going to talk, I mean, my lens is primarily through CTE, but I think a lot of the strategies apply more broadly to, to a broader career development system. Uh, but we know there's a lot of great research out of the Georgetown Center for Education in the Workforce that uh, examines different pathways to good jobs. Um, and these are jobs that are, you know, that, that pay family sustaining wages, um, that allow for career advancement. And some of those jobs are attainable through a traditional high school uh, pathway, but most of those jobs are accessible through um, middle skills pathways that are, uh, you know, allow students to get uh, an industry certification or an associate's degree or through a bachelor's uh, pathway. So we know, we know what paths are needed to get to good jobs. Uh, the challenge uh, kind of going back to, to Doug's framework that he used is to build up the supply, making sure that those opportunities are available and those opportunities are high quality uh, for students to earn those credentials. Uh, next slide. So this is the framework that Advanced CTE has put out that defines the, the core elements of a high quality CTE program. Again, these can apply more broadly, not just to CTE, but to any kind of career pathway. So we think that the, the essential components are that they include rigorous, um, rigorous standards and progressive sequenced courses that build to a recognized uh, credential of value, that they include uh, secondary and post-secondary uh, linkages so that students you know, can get a, a leg up on a post-secondary uh, credential or degree when they're in high school um, and, and experiences that embed uh, dual and concurrent enrollment early college high schools, IB and AP uh, courses uh, can really help students get, uh, get a head start. Um, industry involvement and labor market demand is absolutely critical. Um, business and industry leaders play a role in validating uh, standards, ensuring that programs are aligned with the needs and expectations of their industries, uh, and also helping to identify like what, what are those to use Doug's term again, those, those market value assets. What are the credentials that are recognized by employers when they're making hiring decisions? Uh, high quality instruction is also critical, making sure that teachers have 
uh, the relevant industry experience. Um, a lot of CTE teachers come from the workforce um, or experience externships or other opportunities to help them uh, maintain an understanding of relevant standards and expectations uh, in the industry. And then lastly is experiential learning. So that's your internships, apprenticeships, um, and even kind of extending kind of further down to earlier grades, your uh, job shadowing opportunities, your career fairs, um, really any, any kind of engagement with, uh, with industry and professionals. COVID-19 has created a lot of um, roadblocks. Um, I, I think this slide lost a couple of, uh, of images, um, but I can kind of break down each of these um, quickly. So we're, we know what a quality program looks like, but the challenge is delivering on that level of quality and finding new innovations to ensure that students get access to the same kind of experiences um, in, in new creative and innovative ways. Um, so the, just to summarize some of the challenges that we've been seeing, um, CTE instruction uh, has been a challenge, especially switching to remote uh, delivery, uh, work-based learning, um, delivering uh, assessments and credentialing uh, exams, uh, access to those early post-secondary opportunities, and then in the little arrow underneath, it, it should say um, equity and access because that's something that undergirds each one of these and kind of exacerbates some of the, um, the access issues um, that were pre present before. Um, next slide. So we developed this resource earlier this summer that includes some strategies and key questions for state and local leaders to consider when they're thinking about uh, this was designed through the light of, of re-entry for the fall semester, um, but really thinking about how to get back to, uh, to delivering on, on quality. Uh, and that resource, um, actually, thanks, Anne, for dropping that in the chat. That resource is available at careertech.org slash COVID-19, along with a number of other resources and state examples and tools um, related to COVID. Um, next slide. So I'm just gonna quickly go through um, each of these challenges and some uh, models or, or examples of what states are doing. Um, so as I mentioned, CTE instruction is one of the uh, major challenges. CTE programs um, require kind of hands-on applied learning, which is really difficult to do in a virtual environment. So there, there are some um, states and some districts and colleges that have been able to transition some of the instruction online and are finding ways to um, rotate a small number of students into, into a lab or into the classroom so that they can get that hands-on experience or finding ways um, through uh, augmented reality or videos or whatever to, to help students kind of understand and digest some of that information. Uh, <clears throat> there's also been a lot of investment in building teacher capacity for some of these uh, new strategies. Um, and then I think the number one challenge here uh, is around technology and the digital divide in making sure that students have access to uh, reliable broadband internet, they have access to devices where they can uh, log into Zoom and uh, um, participate in their classes. And one, um, one program that has been in place for a while, but I think is a pretty effective strategy for delivering CTE virtually is North Dakota's interactive television program. Um, North Dakota being a large and uh, large state with a lot of rural communities has invested in virtual CTE for the past um, 30 or so years. And they've built out a really strong system that allows students from across the state to, uh, to dial in and receive um, synchronous uh, real-time learning with uh, CTE professionals um, from across the state. And they've actually set it up to where students can actually participate in a, in a lab um, in work with equipment while receiving instruction from um, a CT teacher virtually. Next slide. Um, Work-based learning also has, uh, has struggled um, with the pandemic uh, as we've had to transition to offering these opportunities virtually um, to the degree possible. Um, so I included JFF's um, kind of career 
uh, our work-based learning continuum here to illustrate some of the challenges. So at the lower end of the continuum with career exploration and career exposure opportunities, we've actually seen an expansion of these opportunities. Um, everybody's becoming more uh, comfortable using Zoom. Um, states and school districts have been able to effectively expand access to these uh, to, to Zoom and other platforms for students. And so what that does is it brings, it allows students to engage directly with industry professionals. Um, Nebraska has a uh, virtual tours program where students can see videos of different um, workplaces. And so those opportunities have actually kind of accelerated during the, the pandemic. The challenges with the, the hands-on career engagement and career experience opportunities, there are a few uh, examples of districts that have um, really accelerated virtual opportunities. DC and Miami-Dade County have both had a lot of success in transitioning their summer youth employment programs to provide virtual internships for students. Um, and I believe in both of those sites, they've been able to um, follow through on most of their commitments for, uh, for summer internship programs. But that said, it has been a widespread challenge um, and those opportunities are very limited. Um, so we're seeing a, a decrease in the availability of work-based learning opportunities. Um, next slide. Another challenge is assessments and credentials. Um, most industry certification exams are provided through third-party um, proctors or um, uh, providers. And it's been a lot of them shut down uh, in the early months of the pandemic for safety reasons. Some of them have scaled up virtual proctoring opportunities or more flexibility for, for offering those assessments. Um, but by and large, there are fewer opportunities for students to actually sit and take a credential exam than there were before the pandemic. Um, Ohio and Florida are two states that have invested heavily in industry certifications over the past several years. Um, Ohio has built it into the accountability system. Florida has a uh, weighted funding system that's uh, connect that incentivizes attainment of industry credentials. And both of those states put out guidance early on that identifies the credential providers that are using trusted methods for virtual proctoring. So that enabled school districts to make the decision um, for, of which credentials they could offer uh, for students virtually. Um, and then there are a few um, credential providers that have been uh, adopting new flexibility in their requirements. Um, as well as state licensing boards that are looking at um, waivers or alternatives for uh, clinical or hands-on um, requirements for earning those, those credentials. Uh, next slide. So when it comes to early post-secondary opportunities, again, um, we see a lot of the same challenges that we see with uh, remote instruction. Um, students there are fewer opportunities for them to engage in these opportunities. It's harder for them to uh, get transportation um, and access uh, using virtual technology. Um, I think one of the biggest barriers that we saw early on too is the rapid switch to pass-fail grading, um, which uh, depending on the institution may or may not transfer. Um, so what we've been seeing is a lot more uh, a push for clarity in uh, how, how post-secondary institutions will accept credit, whether they will accept um, a past grade instead of uh, an actual grade, and then how that would apply towards a student's um, core majors, or if that would only be elective coursework. Um, I included North Carolina on the slide as an example, um, but there are many of other states that have, that are using new course codes or new grade codes to indicate that um, the, the grade was earned during COVID. Um, and some states like Georgia and Louisiana and others allowed students additional time to meet their requirements to earn that credit. Um, so if they had to come uh, into, if they had to meet those requirements over the summer, they were still able to kind of retroactively apply that towards uh, credits earned in the spring. Um, next slide. And then lastly, uh, underlying each of these challenges is uh, challenges with equity and access. 
Um, and we've seen that the pandemic has exacerbated and driven a larger uh, divide uh, across a lot of equity uh, inequities that were already existing before the pandemic. Um, one of the, the major challenges, as I mentioned earlier, was expanding access to broadband internet and technology uh, devices so that students can continue to, to uh, receive instruction, engage with industry professionals, um, participate in virtual internships when they're available. Um, it's also important too for, for states and communities to continue engaging with, uh, with different uh, students and families to understand what their needs are and what the barriers are to, to accessing um, CTE. And then uh, I wanted to highlight um, an example from Oregon, which early on in the pandemic created a framework for, uh, for equity throughout the uh, COVID-19 response and recovery that identifies um, specific targeted populations and focuses on racial equity serving underserved populations, as well as rural populations um, in in focusing on the economic recovery and supports uh, during COVID-19. Um, so it takes an intentional targeted um, effort to ensure that those, uh, those learners don't fall, uh, fall behind during this time. Um, next slide. So just to quickly kind of summarize um, uh, major points. Um, CTE can be a really powerful mechanism for, for supporting the economic recovery and for helping learners get access to those post-secondary credentials. Um, and we're seeing a lot of innovation happening around those, those quality elements that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, but states play an important role in, in allowing that innovation to happen um, and ensuring that they can continue to sustain um, quality and, and ensure equity and access for all. So happy to take some questions. Um, Great. Uh, thank you, Austin. Uh, please use the chat to ask uh, your questions of Austin or to share resources or share ideas. Uh, while you're doing that, um, I'll start off. So Austin, you know, one of the, the big questions we're, we're trying to think through today is how to, you know, get to get to all and make these sort of career development and CTE experiences of close to, you know, close to universal. Um, and it seems that, you know, likely that that will involve some combination of in-person and virtual uh, formats just to reach that kind mm -hmm. of scale. I'm wondering, and I know it's very early, um, but as a, your first thoughts on, you know, in what areas do you think we've got some evidence that virtual could be a good tool going forward? And in what areas have we found that maybe not so much that we have to figure out the face-to-face -face, uh, access um, and, you know, opportunity for all to get to equity? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I, I think to echo what Doug was talking about earlier about those kind of early career exposure opportunities, I think that's the entry point for a lot of students. If you can kind of uh, engage them in elementary school or middle school um, and give them the opportunity to under, to explore different careers and meet with different industry professionals, that can spark an interest in different career pathways and, and ensure that they, they understand what their pathways are. Um, there's even before the pandemic, uh, we've been seeing a lot of efforts by states to expand CT into the middle grades and even elementary uh, school. Um, Perkins 5, the, the federal act um, that funds a lot of CTE programs, is now allowing uh, funds to be spent as low as seventh grade. So that's kind of spurred a lot of this innovation. And I think those opportunities can be done virtually very easily. Um, the Nebraska virtual tours example is, is uh, a good one. Um, Louisiana, even before the pandemic, has been uh, working with an organization called NEPRIS to facilitate these industry engagement opportunities, particularly in rural areas. Um, and I think that's something that's here to stay. I, I think that's one of those economies of scale that Doug, Doug was talking about that we can uh, we can keep. The the more intensive um, internships and apprenticeship experiences, I think are just really difficult to do virtually. Um, and there are a lot of kind of stopgap measures in place right now. Um, but as soon as, you know, as soon as those experiences are safe to deliver in person, I think um, we'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of those opportunities go back to being in person. Great, thank you. Anne, do you wanna give us a chat update? Um, 
So there's been lots of appreciation and kudos uh, to Austin for the work that he's done. Uh, Vesta asks, a lot of our students have little access to broadband and Zoom has been a real problem for them as it crashes or if they have uh, video lags on it. We are trying Meet and it has been more successful in staying connected. Are post-secondary schools looking at Meet or are they sticking with Zoom for the most part? Um, and the one other, a couple of people, Doug, Elmer and Anita in Long Beach have said that they are in, they've invested in NEPRIS. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation. N-E-P-R-I-S. So maybe a way to make Austin, the question a little broader, Austin, if, if folks been learning about just different ways to make the technologies work and get around limitations of any one system. Yeah, I, uh, I know that this has been a major challenge. We've been hearing this a lot from state directors. Actually, earlier on, um, this was uh, something that they were talking about um, a lot. I think a lot of them have invested in expanding um, making sure that students are have access to devices that they have access to reliable internet i know that some have started um I, i've heard some stories of colleges that are or schools that are making their wi-fi available in the parking lot so students can access um but i think that this isn't an issue that's been solved um to be honest and a lot of the investments that we've been seeing even from the federal level in broadband expansion um just we're not going to see that investment payoff right away. It might take um, years before that happens. So um, unfortunately, that's the best response I can give. I, I don't hear a lot of like specific, like what what technology solutions um, are, are being used because we don't really operate at that that level. Um, but I know this is, is still a challenge. I don't know if others in, on the call have ideas that they would want to be sharing. We're just hearing um, from Vesta that, you know, again, the infrastructure to get kids where they need to be is, is a challenge, especially when mm -hmm. uh, it's, you're in a more rural setting um, and don't have a lot of the, the existing either transportation or uh, sort of internet capacities. Um, yeah, what I'd I like to do now, sorry. I was just gonna say, I think she's saying that the, they have these buses with hotspots, but getting the buses to where the kids are is an issue. Gotcha. All right, one last quick question. Uh, and then we have, we have to we'll, we'll open a general discussion after that. Um, Tara asks, how have CTE teachers embraced or not the virtual experience? So it, I, I don't know directly because we mostly work with the state directors, um, but I know that a lot of states have been working as hard as possible to get ideas and strategies and um, tools out to teachers. Um, Michigan, the Department of Education in Michigan created a, an entire um, resource warehouse that's kind of broken out by different subject area that teachers can access um, curriculum and resources for uh, for teaching within each of their different career clusters. Um, it sounds like that's been pretty effective. Um, but again, I think overall, it's everyone's just trying stopgap measures, whatever they can to, to get um, kind of maintain continuity of learning um, until they can go back into the classroom. Thank you. So now we just have a couple of minutes um, and it's sort of open form. If, if folks would like to share like a, a success story they've had with career development or CTE uh, during COVID, now's the time. Um, if you have a, a resource you'd like to share, you can put that in the chat for everyone to take advantage of. Um, this is really a time for us to collectively put our, put our heads together, what we're learning about uh, career development over during COVID and what it means beyond um, things that are working. Uh, struggles we're still having. So please share your, your insights and resources uh, in the chat. And as you do that, I'm just gonna highlight uh, one other resource um, and then we'll, we'll see what we got. 
So another uh, tool that's just out from uh, another one of our community, learning community members, which is the uh, George W. Bush Institute. Um, and they've just put together an educational workforce pipeline state data set, um, which sort of brings together from pre-K uh, through elementary, middle, high school, post-secondary and workforce, um, all the existing uh, indicators and data points for each state to let you look at your state level, um, how you're doing at each point of that continuum. And also they have a feature that if you wanna compare yourself um, and also for each of those areas across the states, they've highlighted sort of bright, bright spots. Uh, as you know, when we've talked a lot in the Pathways to Adult Success Learning Community about the need to get sort of integrated data this is state level data, which is the first step, um, but it is a very nice, easy to use uh, resource where you just plug your state in and the data across all those sectors is there with these sort of comparative and bright spot uh, features. So that's just uh, one other tool we wanted to highlight um, in this area. We have a, a question, is anyone looking at career development re related initiatives as part of their CARES and or ESSER grant priorities from Casey. That's a question to throw out to the group. Yeah, I, I can get the conversation started. Um, we've been seeing some activity from states that are working on um, kind of redirecting some of that CARES Act funding to support uh, career development opportunities and in, in, um, CTE. Um, trying to think of, uh, I know I've seen some work from Florida and Utah and Idaho um, that are specifically working on investing those dollars to support um, career pathways. I'll see if I can find some examples and drop them in the chat. Um, but that's definitely been, I, I think a lot of governors are thinking about the economic recovery um, and are investing in um, short-term credentialing opportunities, career pathways, uh, and others as part of that uh, broader strategy. So that's, um, that's definitely top of mind. I'll, I'll drop in a couple of examples if, if I can find them. Great. Thank you. Our friends at FH360 have been, are sharing a tool they have on uh, remote uh, learning that could be useful for uh, school-based folks. Tara is asking, um, have, are there promising practices that help shift mindsets? Um, as, as families often see CTE is less than college, um, or something that their parent, their parents don't want their kids uh, to do because they they believe it as a lesser value. And we also have a question they're now coming in uh, from from Matthew, wondering if anyone is doing work on uh, incorporating SEL into CTE mm -hmm. and workforce preparation broadly. Bob, to answer Tara's question, we had plans in the works. Um, up until COVID to take one of our most popular student experiences, which is career jumping, where groups of kids kind of work in a speed network with lots of industry professionals. We were gonna do that for parents with um, middle school careers. So they can actually hear from the CTE strands themselves about um, the work they do, the salaries they make, the education they need, because um, we see the power of when kids interact with the industry professionals. So we thought we'd give it a shot of having parents connect with them as well. Um, COVID got in the way in that. So if anybody wants to beat, it, beat us to the punch and try that first, we're, we're happy to learn from you, but uh, we'll report back when we're able to, uh, to give that a try. Cause we thought that might have a lot of promise. And there were some other organizations in Kansas city, the library and a few others that were interested in maybe trying to think about that with us as well. Thank you. And Doug or Austin, any insights on incorporating SEL into CTE? Um, I know briefly for us, we are kind of just trying to preach the gospel that these are the SEL and workplace readiness are often the same traits on a sliding developmental scale. So a lot of the social emotional capacities we're trying to build in elementary and middle school translate into kids who are naturally adapting and picking up what we call the essential or workforce readiness skills. Um, we feel a little bit like a voice in the wilderness about that. So we would love to find others who would want to pick up that argument with us. Um, uh, those seem to be two distinct camps often. So we are trying to bridge the gap. That was, that was Matthew's point that they seem like they're linked, but people tend to silo them. 
Yeah, and I saw somebody in the um, chat dropped in the uh, castle resources. I know they've been doing a lot of work in this area. Um, and the Coalition for Career Development is uh, has been looking into this specifically. Um, I was on a call with them recently and they were talking about this topic. So there's, I think there's some work that's being done in that area. Wonderful. Well, everyone that got engaged by this, there's been multiple resources dropped into the chat. I want to thank everybody for participating. Um, if we go to the next slide, Amanda, I just want to remind us our next uh, solution form is going to be in January 19th. We're going to shift the policy. Seems apropos of the day before inauguration uh, to talk about developing a policy agenda to improve young people's opportunities for adult success. We'll have some good uh, good folks to spark our ideas, but this will, this will also be designed to be a very interactive session. So please come with your policy ideas uh, ready to share. Next slide. Um, so I just want to thank everybody again for a deeply uh, engaging um, and provocative, I think, discussion on how to get career development uh, experiences, exposures, applications, uh, ultimately for all our students um, as a key key cornerstone of building a pathway to adult success. Uh, and thank everybody again for all the work they're doing uh, during these trying times to keep our students uh, headed in that direction. Um, as always, we'll send out the, the, the uh, recording of this, the deck, um, and any resources that have been shared in chat, we'll send that all out to you in a follow-up email. Um, and we wish you all uh, the best holidays uh, and continued uh, good fortune in these challenging times and be well and thank you.